gathering in the faithful promises and presence of Christ. Let us draw near in faith, in word, and in deed, in the fellowship of his people. Amen. I welcome any opportunity to refer back to John the Baptist, uh, that wild, hairy man of the desert, so passionately un-PC and and bold to condemn the leaders of the day, bold to do so partly because he was protected by the truth of what he said, partly because he was protected by popularity, partly because he was protected because, in a sense, he didn't care. His care, his safety, his whole self was wrapped up in what I can't quite decide was either a brute faith or absolutely a surprising gentle faith. Either way, his whole identity was held in God alone and nothing else impacted upon him. He was in the relationship of himself and Jesus, the bruiser, He was breaking up the ground. He was disturbing the roots of every tree and every plant of the nation of Israel to prepare that ground for the more careful, precise, adaptable physician that was the Christ. Christ's message was no less radical, no less disturbing, but it was more precise, more focused, more deliberate, more precision care. In case you can't tell, I like John. But I suspect he probably wasn't the easiest person to have to dinner. I suspect he didn't suffer fools gladly. I suspect he wasn't a great one for small talk. I suspect he was continually surprising us, always leaping on to something new, something unexpected, just when we thought we'd finally got the measure of him and we knew where the conversation would go for the next 10 or 20 minutes. He would be off on something else, probably surprising us equally at those times when he was inactive. And we would have thought he would be the first to leap to his feet and proclaim and protest. Then we follow with Paul and his letter to the Romans. A passage which, as we noted at eight o'clock, and as we noted again now, and thank you for it, relies precisely on the punctuation. Maybe they should use it in lessons of grammar at school. If you don't go with his commas and his full stops, you are lost. If you go with them and follow them, he makes his truth and his sense without wishing to be stereotypical or to be positive or negative, depending on your point of view. He comes across a little like a politician here. He's observing his past and that of his people and he's analyzing it. He's questioning, he's arguing, he's making and drawing conclusions in order to make sense of where it stands. And most of all, in order to find the way, with a capital W, to find the way that God is calling them, to find the way forward. For there are things that are sure and certain. The promise that has been made and reiterated time and again is sure and certain. So where is it? Where is that promise? Where is that way forward? Where is that path of hope and life and blessing? If we've lost sight of it, then it can only be because we've stopped looking and we've assumed we know where it is, what it, look like, what it looks like, what its call upon us is. It has continued on its faithful path and we've drifted off onto something of our own imagining. His analysis, I think, and I would argue, in the passage we heard, could very easily be for us all. It's given from the viewpoint of Christian faith, but it's looking back to Israel as the people of the law, 
the God-given law. Its goodness is without question. A law which so successfully kept them together as a people, directed them, saved them, kept their focus and pointed them towards God. It made them unique in the world as a means of God's blessing and revelation. So why did it not save from sin? How and why is sin still possible, still probable, even when we know and we will to do what is right? I think for me it's still possible and probable because I and we also have the tendencies exhibited by Adam and by Eve. The freedoms of free will, the challenge or the temptation to explore, but not yet the wisdom to know when to do so and when not. And wisdom is vindicated and known by her deeds. And so we find that we have fallen. A law, the law, is broken. And just like Humpty Dumpty, it cannot be put back together. And so trapped, where can there possibly be redemption, Renewal, freedom, that chance to choose and live again. How can it be there? Because it's broken. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, with an exclamation mark as well. There is Paul's revelation. There is the result of his analyzing and his reasoning. There is that same passion that we see in John the Baptist, but here exercised through those who use their mind more than their heart. It takes us all to build this world. By all means, keep the law. But there is in truth only one means by which we can do so. And it's the same as for Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. It's the same as for Ruth and Rebecca and Mary Magdalene. It's not by ticking the boxes. It's not by one law at a time and then moving on to the next. It is only and always by faith. The law of God is there only to point us to God, to bring us into a relationship with him which enables us to live. Just as the law of our land is there only to point us to our neighbour and bring us into a relationship with our neighbour which enables that relationship and those laws to live. So the God-given law not only puts us in our place as mere creation, it also exalts us way beyond anything where we might imagine our place to be to beloved creation. We're not made by a God who sees us as a plaything and as a toy to scurry around in the dust at his feet and for him to flick mercilessly when he pleases. We're made by a loving God to delight and rejoice in this gift of life. And so he seeks to raise us up to his own beloved divine level, to see eye to eye, to know the glory of what it is like him to be alive. To bring us into that ultimate relationship with one another, with creation and with him. The only one to fulfill the law is Christ, who to our minds and to their consternation shook the law to its very roots, but only in order to then replant it. 
not outside of us as something over and against us, but within us as a law of life itself. That it would then well up within us. It would inspire us. It would be the beat of our heart. It would refresh and encourage. And it would then lead us to a living knowledge of eternity. A yoke of no weight that leads to the extraordinary loss of crucifixion, but only in order to lead on to the unimaginable truth of resurrection. Christ walks beside us. A friend of tax collectors and sinners and all who are like them. He walks beside us to reveal the way, to show us the delight of truth and life. Still a promise, again renewed, and in you refined. Refined for us to reimagine the possibilities, the truthful possibilities, the heart-beating possibilities, the living, loving possibilities of just where your life might lead if it's hand in hand with Christ our Lord who walks that way of relationship with God and lifts us up from the dust that we might do exactly the same. Not in the future, not in a world to come, but from now and into eternity. For that, Paul says, I say, and you are invited to say, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.